Good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's webinar for our Master of Education Learning and Leadership course. We're just going to wait for about five minutes for the rest of our registered participants to join. Welcome everyone and thank you for coming along tonight. My name is Layla and I'm an enrollment advisor here at UTS for our online postgraduate courses, including the Master of Education, Learning and Leadership. Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation upon whose ancestral lands our city campus now stands. I pay my respect to the elders past, present and emerging, acknowledging them as the traditional custodians of knowledge for this land and as people of great ingenuity and innovation. In this webinar, we'll be sitting down with our academic team to talk about the trend shaping the development and design of learning, the skills employers are demanding, and how postgraduate study will equip you with the skills, to, the skills and knowledge to enhance and innovate learning process practices. Let's first take a look at your webinar controls. You'll be able to see the chat, raise hands, and Q&A functions. If you have specific questions for our team to answer, please use the Q&A function rather than the other two options. Now let's take a quick look at UTS, Australia's number one young university. We are a university for all, and with our flexible online programs, we want to give adults an opportunity to upskill and earn a degree without sacrificing jobs and other important, important commitments. A common perception of online study is a series of uploaded lecture recordings and PDFs. Here at UTS Online, we have designed our courses from the ground up specifically to be studied online and complementary to the working professional. We'll share a link to a video that goes through our learning design process in the chat for you to view in your own time. Now, before we meet the wonderful academics, I'd like to introduce you to the Master of Education Learning and Leadership course here at UTS. The Master of Education, Learning and Leadership is designed for professionals who are looking to lead, support learning innovation in their practice or organisation, whether in corporate, health, public sector, school, higher education or community settings. This course allows students to customise their learning and assessments to meet specific professional aspirations and upskilling needs with a focus on fostering learning practices, investigating learning and innovation and leading learning and innovation. The course aims to provide students with specialised knowledge, skills and opportunities to shape learning within a professional context. What makes this course really distinctive is that students are directly engaging and learning with globally connected teaching staff who are actively involved in cutting edge research using award winning approaches to teaching and learning. It is also delivered 100% online, which allows students to continue working full time while studying. Students focus on one subject at a time in seven week blocks, allowing them to manage their work and life commitments while gaining the skills to advance their career. 
We're now going to hear from the course director and our wonderful panel about innovation and leadership in learning and how a Master of Education, Learning and Leadership can prepare you with the skills to thrive in your career. Before we get into the topics and questions, let's meet our academic team. Dr. Amanda Lazier is the course director for the Master of Education, Learning and Leadership program at UTS. Amanda, this program offers flexible entry and exit pathways to cater for those with diverse professional backgrounds and career aspirations. In your opinion, what type of professionals would be well suited to the program within the Master of Education, Learning and Leadership portfolio? It's a really good question. Um, thanks for hosting for us tonight. Um, look, we have such a broad range of people in this in our courses, it's really hard to narrow it down. We've got people from corporate sector, schools, higher education, community health, um, all over the place. I think it's probably easier if I break it down by sort of the different qualifications that we've got nested. So as I mentioned, the master's program. Within that, we've got a couple of graduate certificates that are a good place to start. So we've got the graduate certificate in education, learning and leadership. And that's a really great starting place for people who are coming back to study after a long period or new to tertiary study. So you might not already have a degree but you sort of want to test the waters. So people in that sort of um, place in their career, that's a really good spot for them. And also people who are really new into the education space. It's a really, it gives you a really good grounding in some of the key research and the theories to get you started. And that also offers an entry pathway. If you, you know, pass those four subjects, then you can get an offer into the master's program as well. Um, so it's really important for gaining those core academic literacy skills as well. And as part of the portfolio, we have a second graduate certificate, and it's called the Graduate Certificate in Professional and Organisational Learning. And that's really designed for people already working in the field, so working in an education learning leadership type role, who are looking for some more um, specific skills and knowledge around the more strategic aspects of organisational and professional learning. And again, that's across a range of contexts. So that one's really designed for people who already have a qualification, although we do make some exceptions for people with significant experience. Um, and it also offers a direct pathway into the masters, but it's more for those people wanting to get a bit more of that advanced knowledge and skills around um, designing and being more strategic about learning. And then the master's program itself is made up of subjects from those two certificates. And what it allows is much more of a deeper dive into um, sort of that ideas around practitioner oriented research, there's a capstone subject, and the master's is a really great way to take that deeper dive into learning and leadership and gives a really deep understanding of learning and innovation in contemporary organisations. Um, and students who've completed the master's program have ended up in leadership roles um, in education across multiple sectors. Thank you so much, Amanda. We've received lots of positive feedback from students about the practicality in particular for this program, with some graduates noting that an assessment or learning task directly helped them address a challenge in their own workplace or to acquire a new role. How does this course prepare graduates for a career in leading learning, training and or development? I think that's a great question and there's often a misconception that somehow university study is incredibly theoretical and it's just all about the research and it absolutely is we take a very research informed approach but all the work is also really practical um, in our qualifications so in every single subject students are using their own professional practice as a way in which to really ground their work kind of you know use the term loosely but in the real world um, and in addition to, you know, the more rigorous aspects of learning at a master's level, um, you know, like becoming acquainted with the research and, and relevant theories, we also provide a lot of opportunities to learn from industry and to learn some of the more concrete skills and tools that um, you, know, you can take out and use right away in your everyday work. Um, there's also, you know, one of the other kind of misconceptions, I suppose, but a way that we prepare people, we do really encourage people to network, to collaborate, um, you know, there are no group assessments in the degree we, we've sort of gone away from that but we have lots of opportunities to work together in learning partnerships and discussion groups to give people a chance to learn together to share ideas and so building those skills around collaboration so that people can then go on um, into leading learning and development spaces. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Amanda. I believe as well, Megan, who is on the panel today, is a prime example of a student that has achieved a career outcome from this degree. We're going to meet Megan very soon to hear more about her journey. Now, before we meet our panel, we wanted to spend a few minutes unpacking this program a little bit more for you. 
A common question that we get from prospects is how does a Master of Education, Learning and Leadership differ from a teaching qualification? Amanda, are you able to provide your perspective on this? Yeah, that's a really good question and one that we get quite often. So I think, so going back to what I was saying before, that the Master of Education, Learning and Leadership is really designed for professionals who are looking to lead and support learning innovation in their organisation. And that could be across many sectors, which I was listing off before. Um, and what's quite different for a teaching qualification, I suppose, is in our qualification really focuses on the learning of adults in the workplace and their professional development rather than that of school students, which a teaching qualification would. And also our Master of Education is not what's called a NESA accredited degree. So it would not qualify people to teach, which a Master of Teaching would. But for the teachers that come and join us, they're already qualified. And that's really for those people who are wanting to take that next step in their career into perhaps a more leadership oriented role. Fantastic. Thank you so much again, Amanda. Now we're going to meet the rest of our panel for this evening. We're very excited to welcome two former students of the Master of Education, Learning and Leadership program and a UTS alumnus. Firstly, we will have Megan Spindler-Smith, who is an experienced learning and development professional who is a Master of Education, Learning and Leadership alumna, as well as now teaching in some of our subjects. Megan, as mentioned before, you are the prime example of a student who has achieved a career outcome from this course. We would love to hear more about your career journey in learning and development. Why were you drawn to study a Master of Education, Learning and Leadership with UTS? And what were your key takeaways and achievements from completing the program? Yeah, so for me, I sort of started off uh, doing subject matter expert style training in the medical and clinical research field. and. The thing that I realized was that though I was great at training, I didn't really understand the theory behind it. And I didn't really have any way of building my career further into learning and development. And so when I went uh, looking for a postgraduate in this space, I actually kind of came down to two different universities, I'm not going to mention the other one. Uh, and the other one was just very too academic and not practical enough. And that was something that was a big sale for me for UTS was the fact that it was about being able to practically put what I was doing into practice. And due to that fact, I actually ended up using one of my assessments uh, for, for a job interview that got me um, my first full time learning and development role at uh, New South Wales Department of Education. So I set up the their first learning and development um, area within human resources at um, New South Wales Department of Education and then was able to utilize that to now uh, also helped me um, apply for and gain my role as a senior executive at ABC um, in leadership and talent development and I also happened to uh, be working quite uh, in depthly in both inclusion, diversity and leadership. And I now actually specialize in leadership. And a big part of that is because of the learning that I gained from how do we actually develop leaders? How do we um, do learning in a way that's practical for our staff? And how do we do it in a way that makes the realization that every day people are learning, it's an addition to their job. It's not um, something that is their full-time job. Learning is not their full-time job. And how do we include it, incorporate it and stop making it feel like it's just a lot of hard work. And, and so that's been uh, a big passion and a big driver from what I've gained from this uh, Masters. Amazing. Thank you so much for sharing your story with us, Megan. I personally love hearing about our student success stories. We also have Mitchell Osman joining us today. Mitch, you entered into the Master of Education, Learning and Leadership as a teaching and learning coordinator in higher education and now work as a learning experience lead at UTS College. Could you please tell us a little bit about your career transition? Absolutely. Look, um, it's uh, a bit of an interesting history, but um, I've been in the higher education space for quite a number of years where I worked as a professional, uh, supporting a lot of the functions that universities do, um, you know, looking after coordinating 
teaching and learning sort of activities, timetabling, exams, and those sorts of things. Um, and when I entered into this course, um, that's exactly what I was doing. And I was looking to sort of uh, make that next step across into like leading the actual um, education space for academics and, and those who work in higher education. So um, part of what this course enabled was, you know, I think halfway through my studies, uh, a new job opportunity opened up and I was able to move into a teaching and learning team where I actually had some, um, you know, direct uh, responsibilities for uh, managing the learning of the academics and then helping them to become better teachers in the space that they were in. Um, and of course, uh, through the completion of this, this course, uh, the leadership opportunities it opened up for me, uh, sort of enabled me to step up into a management position uh, in teaching learning space. And then this next step across, which I've just taken into leading a team of learning designers who again are now giving back into the academics that they support. So uh, a bit of a world wind journey, but uh, one that was absolutely fabulous to be a part of. Fantastic. Thank you so much for sharing a little bit about your journey with us as well, Midge. Now we've got last but certainly not least, Ben Stanton, who is a UTS alumnus and a teacher with over 20 years experience in leadership roles. Ben, what was your opinion and why is it important for teachers to upskill in this era of accelerating change? Um, well, first of all, good evening, everyone. Um, and look, I think it's really interesting um, concept, this upskilling or, or learning, um, which has always been a significant part of professional development as a teacher and an educator. Um, it's somehow in the current climate of accelerating change in the last couple of years, especially, it's become even more of a necessity. I mean, if we only consider uh, the recent events that have led us to the current world that we're now navigating through, i.e. the pandemic, the escalating political tensions across the world and uh, uh, the economic outlook, all of those things that we, we hear about every day, um, combined with our own personal reflections towards career and, and what our values are. Um, I think how much learning has, has taken place for us all individually over these past few years, um, I guess that's not that different to, to the past, but of course, it would also be remiss of me not to mention the, the well-documented um, and reported considerations from the government towards recruitment and retention in the teaching profession. Um, and that consideration toward upskilling and development in their or in our career trajectories. Um, as I said, the, the world's had a few years of throwing significant curveballs at us all um, and personally, I think being able to draw on the concepts around innovation and leadership um, through the course made um, some significant improvement to my ongoing practice as a professional. And I, I think it's easy to think of teachers in a school environment to be, you know, um, teaching to, to the, the students, to the, the youngsters, but actually, um, the learning and the, the upskillings happening between colleagues and and depending on, on different roles that are happening or if you think of the, the team that you may manage um, so they're really important areas to really consider fantastic thank you so much for sharing a bit about your background with us as well ben and thank you for the rest of the panel for your responses and sharing your stories with the audience now we are very excited to gain some insight from each of you in relation to the industry, especially given your diverse professional backgrounds. Now let's dig into the industry, starting with employment prospects. According to Labor Insights, the demand for training and development professionals is expected to grow by 7.4% to reach 23,000 jobs by 2026. Now I'm going to throw this question to you firstly, Amanda. What factors do you think are underpinning this growth? So interesting. I spent prior to academia, spent about 20 years in industry. And if you'd have asked me pre-pandemic, I would have given you a really different answer. But as we are not pre-pandemic anymore, um, you know, there was always a lot of talk about this idea of this weird phrase, the war for talent, and it's finally hit. And I think organizations are now really thinking, okay, we need to keep the people we've got. We need to look at the skills, the capabilities we have and build on that basis. And we need learning people to help us do that. I think that's across industries. So, you know, 
Ben's recent point about you know teaching is a good example a lot of ongoing development there's a real culture of that but in other industries not as much and so there's a real range of needing you know learning people in this really tight labor market um with there's sort of two parts to that one is how do we upskill the people that we have and that sort of also ties into this idea of the future of work so things like that we didn't really think about before but we should have done so data literacy I was talking to someone about yesterday and how that's becoming a really really important skill set how do you understand data how do you tell stories through data it's not a skill set we've looked at before but we really need to and I think the, the flip side of the tight labor market is that maybe you can't quite find the exact fit for the role that you were hoping for but they've got sort of the right attitude the right values the right cultural fit and maybe we can train them up and so again then you need a really strong you know, group of learning professionals behind you to have the right strategy and the right processes in place to do that from a strategic organizational perspective. Fantastic. Thank you so much for sharing your insights with the audience, Amanda. I'd like to throw that same question again to Megan. What factors do you think are underpinning this growth? I think one of the biggest factors that is underpinning it from my perspective is the fact that organisations are recognising, especially because of things like the pandemic that's happened, how important organisational culture is and how we can actually drive learning but also how we can drive people to want to stay choose us and also be able to hold on to those skilled professionals but offer them a safe space where they can be themselves they can come to work they can 100 percent be themselves and i think also because we are more open from a diversity and inclusion perspective and of course i'm going to talk about that it's a passion for me but because of that, we need to have people who are experts in how adults learn and how they can engage in that. And so because of that, it's kind of flipping from being uh, just really strong and a subject matter expert to being able to take an overarching view and look at learning from a strategic perspective and how it integrates into organizational strategy. So just as an example at the ABC, learning is a key strategic factor in you know, our public strategy statement. So, and that is what we're seeing in many organizations in both the public and private sector. Um, so I would say it's a big cultural shift, uh, but also the fact that we want to hold on to the, um, the skilled people and be able to T-shape and expand their knowledge. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Megan. And I'll throw the same question to you as well, Mitch. What factors do you think are underpinning this growth? Look, similar to what both Amanda and Megan have said, um, post-pandemic, obviously, uh, organisations are realising that, you know, in order to retain the good people that they have, they need to pour more resources into them to support them, to help them grow. Um, and that's everything that, you know, this uh, is what we're talking about, you know, um, the, the learning professionals, the people who understand how adults acquire new knowledge and grow themselves through an organisation is going to help those organisations to retain them and, you know, um, you know, keep their workforce um, intact. Uh, so there's probably less disruption from people moving to and fro. Um, and, you know, all of that that just comes from the chaos that has been the last two years. Stability is something that organisations are really going to want to look for. Couldn't agree with you more there, Mitch. And again, Ben, what are your thoughts on the underpinning growth in this industry? Uh, well, you know, I think, again, I'll just, I've got to echo what, <laughs> what the panel have already, uh, have already said there. Um, you guys must have copied my notes before. <laughs> um, I, I think, um, you know, I, I, from my perspective, I think it, it is the, the multi-dimensional changes of the pandemic. And as we're talking about this now, I, I feel like every answer that I'm going to give tonight, by the way, I'll probably mention the pandemic. I'm not the doom. I'm not the doomsayer. Sorry. Um, but I, I think, you know, as we uh, have all kind of experienced um, reflection uh, I think on careers and values and, and fulfillment and so too as organizations and employers are doing the same sort of thing as, as Mitch said, the, the retention, 
Um, we, we have the constant advancement of technology kind of moving at a, a rate of knots as well that, um, you know, as the working population grows, so too does this, this demand for, for, um, for the, the training and, and developmental roles that are just really key and integral in, um, in kind of, you know, the broad stroke of society. Fantastic. Another fantastic answer. Thank you so much, Ben. Now, a common misconception about a career in education is that it is limited to, to, to traditional school teaching environments. However, this couldn't be further from the truth. In fact, according to Labor Insights, the top industries hiring and training who are hiring training and development professionals include public administration and safety, education and training, health and social care and professional, scientific and technical services. What types of positions, Amanda, can graduates, graduates pursue now and in the future? Oh, I, I've been doing this for a while now and I'm still amazed by some of the job titles and, and professions that walk through the door, which is fantastic because we just get so many interesting discussions happening. But look, I think you know, education is an obvious one. And we do actually have a lot of people who work in what you might call a traditional education field. But I would then expand that. So yes, schools, absolutely. There's an expanding number of roles in schools that are more staff facing than student facing. I think that's a really interesting area. So, um, you know, people who are teachers but start to work in innovation spaces, who start to work in professional development for teachers and supporting that and in research roles in schools. So that, there's some really interesting emerging roles in that space. We've had people come through our course doing those sort of roles. Um, you know, much like Mitch has in higher education, a lot of, um, sort of learning design roles, teaching and learning, um, not really support roles, teaching and learning strategic roles. Um, you know, there, there's a, in universities sometimes, you know, we, we get our PhD and we go and teach, but we're not always qualified for it. I'm pleased to say I am, but, you know, a bit of support is always good. So there's those sort of roles. Um, vocational education, again, you know, private providers, TAFE sector, all of those sort of areas. And, you know, in the corporate sector, there's so many. So there's a sort of learning and development, more traditional, you know, the old-fashioned trainer kind of roles. There's also sort of going into sort of more um, organizational development, which is the more strategic sort of roles and, and a little bit into the HR space. So starting to take what you know about learning, but then also apply some of that to things like performance management, talent planning, you know, integrating um, those sort of systems. And I think what's sort of unique about what we are doing is that because we deal with all those aspects of workplace and professional learning, it makes it quite distinctive because we get all the benefit of it being a really diverse group of people. And I mean, we've had people who are digital media specialists come through. So it's just this fantastic diversity. Um, but also students individually can focus on what's meaningful for them in their professional practice. And so we've got this really nice balance between I can bring what I do to the table and I can tailor my work and my assessments around that, but I can also hear what's happening in other places. Um, and so, yeah, you might find yourself learning alongside, you know, a school principal and a clinical nurse educator and a, an L&D manager and a higher education learning designer. And, um, you know, we, we sort of have that broad church. I think, I think in the future it'd be really interesting. I've seen a lot of trends around this idea of shifting toward performance, very much individualized learning. So I think there'll be some roles that we haven't quite even thought of yet where a broad kind of understanding of learning to give you that basis, then you can kind of shoot off in a lot of different directions. Fantastic. Thank you, Amanda. That was really interesting. I'm going to throw this question to you next, Megan, as a previous student of our Master of Education and Learning and Leadership. What types of positions can graduates pursue now and in the future? I mean, I think, uh, as, as it was said, I've been able to do and transition my career due to the Masters, and I know that is the case. So for me, obviously, um, heading up a learning and development function within an education department is quite an interesting role to be in because I wasn't a teacher and I didn't have any teaching background, but I worked very closely with a lot of teachers and kind of brought the adult learning perspective 
to how we would do things. And so it actually worked really well because we were able to uh, speak the same language, uh, just bring different perspectives. And so from my, you know, from my view, that was really useful. And now at the ABC, I do everything from diversity inclusion um, to leadership to talent management as uh, Amanda spoke about. So, you know, I do more of an OD style role, an organizational development style role. And what I am responsible for is succession, uh, talent management, uh, and also giving coaching advice to senior executives. And so it's quite a device a diverse range. And in addition, you know, I, I've been lucky enough to be doing an inclusive fellowship with UTS, uh, sort of specializing in inclusive practices within education. Uh, and that's again, working with people in multiple spaces. And due to both my masters and that, um, I am now one of the inaugural directing change scholars. So it's about trying to get more people with disabilities like myself um, on boards. And so realistically speaking, from a master's perspective, this has really opened up the world to me. And, and there's a lot of different options to, to look at not just your kind of classic training manager style role or subject manager role. There's a lot of different options available now. Fantastic. Thank you for sharing your insights with the audience, Megan. Finally, I would love to throw this question to you, Ben. What types of positions can graduates pursue now and in the future? Well, um, I, I think, honestly, I'd say, whatever position a graduate wishes to pursue not to be um <laughs> confrontational with that answer but I, I think um from myself from my own perspective what, one of the outcomes of the of completing the course was definitely um building my confidence to to innovate and lead my team um i i probably should have noted that I you know I, I do I'm student facing but also lead a, a team of about 20 instrumental teachers currently and you know as I, I think within the course as learners we're, we're challenged the expansive concepts are presented throughout um, that we all experience and digest often we're you know my fellow students in the metal course are start working full-time um, so dealing with our full-time work requirements and stuff like that as well. So, so completing the postgraduate study is a, is a big deal, but being able to draw that, draw on those things, I, I found has, has just been really, really useful um, in, in all aspects of, of my, my career and my, my current, current role. So just jumping back to it, I, I really do think that you know, without the crystal ball of, of what some of those roles will look like in the future. Um, I, I really do think that the, the sky is the limit not to not to um, harp on about that, but, you know, go for it. That's what I that's what I'd say. Use it and be confident with with the qualification. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Ben. That was a really engaging and also inspiring response. Now, according to Labor Insights, employers are currently seeking training and development professionals who have strong interpersonal skills and who possess specialist knowledge in learning strategies and active learning. Amanda, why do you think these skills are important for education leaders and how does the Master of Education Learning and Leadership course provide such skills to students? There are absolutely critical skills in learning. And I think, <clears throat> excuse me, and again, I was having this conversation with someone just the other day, you know, a, a learning role, it, sort of regardless of sector, is one of those roles where there's a lot of influencing needs to be done, a lot of stakeholder engagement, um, a lot of synthesizing information and, and needs and interests from lots of different groups of people and bringing it together. And so I can really see why employers are looking at the interpersonal skills as being um, sort of really critical to in those learning roles. And I think the way that we sort of engage with that when we you know, try to do it, I think the ability to um, customise learning is really important. So to bring some of those curly issues with you to class and go, you know, I've got these stakeholders that are driving me crazy. What can I do? Let's work through it. Um, and sort of having that balance, you know, we do talk through the research. We do talk about, you know, things like active learning. We talk about 
you know, designing those sort of experiences, being strategic about those sort of experiences. Uh, and we do actually talk a lot about the, those sort of power and interest structures and how you can navigate them in the most productive way. And that actually appears in quite a few of the, the subjects to help people really orient themselves to what's happening in their context. So not just the nitty gritty of I'm going to design a thing, but how might I go about it? How do I navigate an organisation um, to, to get through that? And I think the other way that we do that is we have something called the capability wrap that's quite unique to our course. And that's another part of the personalising. So what students can do is come in and really think quite deeply around what they want out of the course and around each subject. And so that's something they do at the outset in the very first subject that they complete. And they keep coming back to that and over time create a their own personal learning portfolio where they can look at their objectives, their career goals, um, and look at how what they're learning relates to that and really build that up over the course of the whole degree. Fantastic. Thank you so much. I'd also love to ask you, Mitch, what your th thoughts were on this. Why do you think these skills are important for education leaders? Well, obviously, interpersonal skills are some of the most in demand, you know, requirements of all employees across any organisation. You know, you can look through the research and find number one, what they're looking for is can this person actually communicate well? Can they interact with our other employees? You know, we want to employ people who are going to fit in and are going to help build that organisation up. So, um, you know, from an organisational perspective, it's it's fundamental that any graduate of, of master programs and you know this one's no different are imbued with those sorts of capabilities that they can you know come into an organization and know how to fit in and know how to ask the right questions and know how to you know push certain things here and there and innovate in certain ways um, and then on top of that the specialist knowledge that comes through uh, through this degree um, you know just adds to that uh, ability of the individual um, to you know come into an organization as a learning professional uh, and be really confident in sharing those skills and understanding uh, and helping that organization to grow. Thank you, Mitch. That was really informative as well. I'd also like to ask you the same question, Megan, if that's okay. Why do you think these skills are so important? I mean, obviously, from a perspective of when I mentioned before culture and organizations, in the in the long run the soft skills the power skills the effectiveness skills they're called many different things um they're not that soft so i don't think soft skills work very well but i think one of the reason those skills are so important is because you need to be able to get messages across in an efficient and effective timeline and as as kind of uh corporate as that might seem from my perspective you're not going to get things over the line if you can't and you want to be able to do what is best for the staff and be able to get them access to uh, opportunities and learning and you can't do that if you're not able to communicate what it is you know now i will say things like for me the masters helped me deal with my whole imposter syndrome where i felt like and eh, i got no i've got no clue and i'm just kind of sitting here pretending to be um this expert but actually it made me realize a i had more knowledge than i thought i did but b i am more of an expert than um i th i think and it helped me feel that com confidence that meant that i could go into very big senior executives and sit down with you know managing directors and and be able to have conversations that were very realistic about what is learning and how do we do it for our organization from a strategic perspective that means that we're not kind of just going down the same pathway every time that has stopped working and and being able to understand all the different layers within that um, and communicate that to multiple different layers within an organization especially organizations that are diverse like department of education like the abc where you have so many different roles um almost no two people do the same thing in any of those places so that was something that made a huge difference and it is why we need to look to be more strategic in how we're doing learning. And I know the masters um, does that. I, I'm lucky enough to be able to teach one of the subjects that, that look and focus on that. So, yeah. Thank you so much, Megan. I couldn't agree with you more. Confidence is absolutely key. 
Now, I'd love to build on this discussion a little bit further. Amanda, why should students consider a postgraduate degree to obtain such skills over a short course like training and development certification? I think that's a great question because all of those options have a place. Um, and so I think, you know, short courses, those sort of things are good for very short, sharp things. You want to do it quickly. You need something quite specific and you're quite clear on what it is that you need. And I think if you've got that clarity, then maybe something short and sharp is for you. Um, I think then you've got things like, you know, the in many sectors, there's a certificate for um, in uh, TAE, was it training and assessment? And so that's a really good en entry point and it will give you some of the core skills. I think where postgraduate qualifications come in is, and then I found this in my own experiences as well as as a teacher, was I could have some of the core skills, but I didn't always understand the why. You know, I do this, but why do I do it that way? Uh, you know, what, what's, what's the research telling me? That was the bit I didn't really have. And that's what having the postgraduate qualifications brought. So I did my master's quite early on in my learning and development career. Um, and having both really made a difference. I think the other thing it did was having that qualification really show that I was quite serious about you know, learning where I want to be. And so in terms of that progression and being seen as a leader in the field, um, it really kind of, you know, pinned my colours to the mask. I was like, yeah, I'm serious about this. I've committed to study it. Um, and I've taken that next step sort of a bit beyond the just the how do I do it to why am I doing it? Fantastic. Thank you so much, Amanda. I'm so glad you shared that because this question comes up in my calls nearly every week. So it gives me um, some more information to talk with our potential students about. Now, let's zoom out and take a look at the industry a bit more broadly. I'm going to throw this question to the panel, starting with you, Amanda. What are the key trends shaping learning and education in the workplace? Yeah, this is this is right in my research area, so I'm very, very happy in this, this space. Um, but the thing is, in the post-COVID world, the location of work is an interesting one because previously, if you thought about workplace learning, workplace was really key. Everyone, mainly everyone, rocked up to the same place at reasonably the same time every day and so you had that common space, that, sh that shared experience. And in a lot of places, that's gone. And there's a lot of soul search around, well, how do we get people back? Do we want to get people back? What might that look like? I think from a learning perspective, that's really interesting because a lot of the assumptions around how we were doing workplace and professional learning were built around this idea of the common experience. So you could deliver a course and be reasonably assured people would be on site to do it. Whereas now you might have staff working remotely around the country or around the world, and you've now got this, this challenge of creating really meaningful experiences and facilitating those experiences that are personalised but also I guess, facilitate you know, what the organisation's trying to achieve as well, which has always been the case for learning. But I think that, you know, diversity in the physical place of work, you know, the site of work um, is becoming a really, really important one. Um, and also part of that is the, the continuing shift to online learning. I think we were sort of doing it before, but it, it was an add-on in some cases. Not everywhere. There's some really great examples. But I think now it's become really quite central and understanding how it works, how you might engage with it, the different options available uh, is becoming a really big one. And I think a really big trend that's been going on for a few years now, and I think it's really just going to accelerate again, given that people are probably taking a much more individual view of their own career because they are working at home like they are now and, and doing all that sort of thing. And so how do you help people as individuals meet their needs, but again, also, you know, meet the training needs of an organisation. And so those ideas around personalised learning, um, you know, in a society where people can watch whatever they want, whenever they want on Netflix, how can you kind of take some, you know, innovate in that space and kind of build a learning culture around similar principles? Wonderful. Thank you, Amanda. I'd also love to ask you, Megan, what are your thoughts on this? What do you think the key trends are that are shaping learning and education in the workplace? I think obviously I very much agree with what um, Amanda has said in this space. The one thing I would also add is the fact that due to the need for us to make our workplaces more accessible, more inclusive and more viable for all staff to be able to not only do their job, but be themselves. Um, and the, the pandemic's definitely had something to do with that, but that's been a trend that has been coming for a while 
because of that one of the big trends that is definitely happening is how do we not only individualize learning but take a strategic view in how we individualize learning and make it accessible and inclusive without uh, creating a space where we're going so far beyond any one skill level that we're not actually able to help people progress and develop. And, and so that is really one of the big trends that I'm seeing. Uh, and, and that potentially might be just because of the field that I'm working in, but definitely more inclusive learning and more accessibility and taking an accessibility first perspective to how we do workplace strategic learning uh, is definitely one of the big trends that is is coming. Amazing. Thank you, Megan. I'd also love to hear your thoughts, Ben. What do you think are the key trends shaping learning and education in the workplace? Um, well, you know, uh, again, uh, I, I I think what Amanda and, and Megan have, have added here, uh, I, I don't know if I have a huge um, addition to, to that, but I guess from from my perspective, something that, that sort of sits in my mind just re revolves around this kind of idea of um, technology and how that's supporting um, supporting the learning in the workplace. So, I mean, we all understand the, the, the concept, the online learning and the remote learning and so forth. But I just think that possibly through... Um, through the different digital technologies that we have available, what that learning actually looks like, what those spaces look like uh, online, maybe metaverse sort of um, aspects there. And then conversely, I, I think also depending on what the sort of learning is that we're trying to uh, deliver or that's that's appropriate for the, for the workplace, um, where does that technology assist if if some of that learning is medical or you know in my perspective in, instrumental where where there's equipment that is required where we you know there's all of these kind of um kind of thoughts around those um those things but virtual reality immersive realities and so forth i think they're becoming um certainly more widespread in their use uh, and it's an exciting space to to see where that that takes us in the future fantastic thank you ben and to everyone else in the panel for sharing your insights i do have a final question that i wanted to ask i wanted to start with amanda what are the key challenges in the industry that we need to solve and how does the master of education learning and leadership course prepare students to tackle some of these challenges yeah i mean i think and with this First statement is a bit based on my own experience and what drove me to research in the first place and then what I subsequently found out in my research, which is, you know, a key challenge is often organisations can talk a good game when it comes to learning, that they're very experience-based and dynamic. But oftentimes, not always, but often, there's an over-reliance still on that more traditional face-to-face -face, or in some cases online, that really kind of didactic learning, you know, where you're an empty vessel, we'll fill you up with knowledge kind of approach. And we need to think about being much more flexible and adaptable with learning and, you know, kind of letting people choose their own adventure, um, aligning more with people's own actual experiences. So we need to really um, help people, get better at helping people learn more on the job. And then the really important part of that is how to proactively reflect on that experience because that's really where the learning happens. So I think that's a bit of a challenge. Um, I think like I was saying before, people working remotely will continue to be a bit of a challenge. But then again, it's also a really great opportunity for innovation and to sort of see point one. Maybe that's a good excuse to sort of shake things up a bit in that space. And I think, you know, learning, the idea of a learning development professional in any area, it's still in some ways quite an emerging profession. Um, you know, it, we haven't quite you know, got, I guess, a lot of consistency. There's a lot, of, a lot of people doing a lot of different things. And so I think what we really need um, is people with the, you know, sort of more common ground, a more solid grounding in, in learning theory and in, in those principles that can then use that plus their own experiences and their knowledge of their own organisations and their field as a basis for innovating in the space. Um, and I think that can really be quite a generative thing. You know, if we have a more common language around some of the bases of what we know around adults learning at and for work. 
um, I think that yeah, that's a challenge to sort of continue working on. I think that's where something like our masters can come into that by helping people create that common language, you know, go back to this idea of the why. Well, you know, that's great. You know, and asking good questions, I think Mitch referred to that before. Helping people ask the right question. You may not always not always know the answer, but you know, I always remember when I was an L and D manager, a lot of people would want to sell you stuff and that's great. But how do you ask really good questions about whether or not that's the right thing for your organization? Is it really going to do what it says on the box? You know, those those sort of um, skills to, to really just help people build on that to innovate in their own spaces. Fantastic. Couldn't agree with you more, Amanda. It's um, it's very important to make sure you do ask the right questions. I would love to hear your thoughts on this, Mitch. What do you think? Look, I'm probably not going to add anything new to the conversation. Uh, it's been covered you know, quite widely tonight. Um, but obviously, uh, remote work is a big issue that's going to be facing um, organisations as we move into how do we do workplace learning. Um, people working from home, um, you know, we need to look at new ways of delivering uh, online learning, hybrid learning, what does, you know, as Amanda said, the old didactic face-to-face -face stuff, what does that look like in this new century uh, when people are just not present in an actual physical work environment? Um, so, you know, that's that's a huge uh, opportunity for, you know, graduates of this kind of program to go out into industries and organisations and raise those questions and figure out um, how we can actually make this work and help those organisations to progress uh, on that front. Fantastic. Thank you so much for sharing your insights with the audience. We're now going to open the floor to questions for our Q&A for the evening. So we're going to kick off with some frequently asked questions and then we're going to begin answering the questions that have come through the Q&A box. Amanda, does this co course offer recognition of prior learning for teachers? Yeah, it does actually. So I guess you're back to that question before around teaching degree and education degree so yeah in recognition of sort of what's been covered in those teaching degrees yes we do offer um 24 credit points of recognition for people with a recognized teaching degree fantastic thank you so much now we have a question here from one of the students who are here this evening and they've specified they're a full-time working uh professional clinician and then a part-time one day a week mentor and team leader who's involved with cpd participation and training modules it's 100% adult education, and they want to know if the master's program is Commonwealth supported. Um, no, we'll give the short answer. <laughs> Thank you so much, Amanda. We've got another question here. I'd actually love to hear this answer from you, Amanda. How many hours would you recommend needs to be committed each week to complete this program successfully? I'm going to answer it and I'm going to put Ben on notice that as someone who's just completed it, he's going to give another answer. Um, so we normally suggest to people, because this is an accelerated format, so we do sort of like a you know, six weeks of intensive learning, um, we suggest to people that that's around 15 to 20 hours a week. So that includes reading time, online activities, um, you know, Zoom sessions if you choose to attend, assessments, but that's what, what we suggest. But Ben... What's what's realistic from your point of view? Um, I, I look. I I was I would agree with that. I think um, it it fluctuates. So uh, designing for the average is is a bit of a <laughs> a, 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 a folly, um, I guess. But um, yeah, look, I I'm a teacher in an independent school. It's a it's a full on full on role. Um, but I managed it. And, and enjoyed it you know I, I think that's the that that's the key as long as you um, come into it really wanting to do it you're going to have a great time you find the time to do it um, sure there's ups and downs and you know certain at certain points there's some stresses and um, as far as life coming into things and and whatnot but um, but yeah I, I think I managed to to lead a, a relatively normal life and study and work full time at the same time. So, um, so yeah, that's my answer. Yeah, I think I would say the vast majority of our students do actually work full time. I could agree with that. In the calls that I have every single day, I would say about 95% of our students work full time while they study with us. So we've got our next question here, and I'm just going to throw this to the panel in general. How are free learning packages by the government impacting the education space and future trends? 
Um, I'm already unmuted. Oh, Megan, you can start this time. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Go. Uh, look, from my perspective, it doesn't it doesn't impact what I do. So, and what I mean by that is realistically speaking yes it's really useful from a basic knowledge perspective but what it doesn't do it, it doesn't allow for that deeper learning and that ability to shift from knowing to doing and i think that's where the difference is so this space and the future trends of this space is not just that didactic or that down centered here's the knowledge now i fill you up kind of concept it is now about how do i move you from knowing to being able to do and then to be able to actually be that aspect and and so the free learning packages are really great for people that are wanting to do um, maybe a small flip to a career change or maybe they want to start or be a starting point, but it doesn't necessarily impact how we're going to be moving forward and also it it all it's doing is driving us to make learning more hands on more engaged and more about how do we make it practical and uh, use the knowledge time as a separate space. So how do we use the time in the best way possible for the learners? Fantastic. Thank you so much, Megan. Now I've got another question here, noting that most students are mature age workers with lots of other commitments. Is there any flexibility when it comes to assessment extensions or even taking a study period off? Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's the thing where, you know, we're, we kind of all get it, you know, we're, we're all, and actually some of our teachers are working and teaching and so we're all kind of juggling things. So yeah, absolutely. You know, I mean, without needing to get documentation and things, we can sort of give sort of around three to five days, there's provision for further arrangements, you know, adopt certificates and things. So there's quite a few options and all the subject coordinators are really good at kind of you know, working through that with people and negotiating. And, and yeah, you know, I mean, the course is set up to kind of keep going. You know, we kind of call it the carousel, but absolutely. I think, you know, most people at some point would probably take a break for maybe one session at some, some stage in their studies. And that's absolutely fine. They just come back on for the next one. Fantastic. We've got another question from the audience. One of the audience members would like to know, because this program is 100% online, how would you describe how we can support students in this journey? Um, that's a really good question. Well, I think the way we do it, our, we put a lot of time into the learning design of each subject to make sure that it can be completed asynchronously. You know, So you could, if you wanted to, just sit there and kind of complete everything. And so we've got a lot of scaffolding. We use a, a product called Canvas, a lot of scaffolding, a lot of, we kind of call it teacher talk, to say, why are you doing this activity? Or why are you reading this thing? What are you hopefully getting out of it? You know, then opportunities to you know, get onto discussion boards and padlets and this sort of thing and contribute and get feedback. And so that's how we um, sort of, you know, try and facilitate the online learning. And then we also have more synchronous sessions. So, you know, at least three or four times per session, you'd have a chance to get together with your teachers, with the other students, kind of do a you know, slightly more traditional, you know, like online classroom kind of mode. Um, so, yeah, so that, that's how we manage it. But we've put a lot of work into trying to design things that are a really good balance between theory and practice, um, that are really customizable for students. And then we've tried to scaffold it really um, heavily to help students through that process. Amazing. I'd also love to hear your thoughts on this, Megan. What did you think of our student support services while you were studying? Uh, so I I didn't really um, need to use them much, but I have from more of a teaching perspective worked with them and found them uh, really helpful, especially when you're able to have a discussion around how do we support a student individually and make sure that they're getting what they actually need rather than, um, you know, sometimes it can feel like you get lost in a system when you're learning. And I know I definitely did that with my undergrad, um, but that's called you know, <laughs> doing a forensics undergrad, of course. Uh, but with the, the postgrad space, because we are dealing with lives at the same time, that extra support and that extra advice can make a huge difference because it recognizes that we're individuals learning and not just a number uh, learning. And so that 
can make a huge difference and it has, it does. Thank you so much, Megan. I've got another question from the audience that I would love to throw to you, Amanda. Are the assessments varied in nature? Are they all essay or research based? That's a great question. And I can hand on heart say, I don't think we've got a single essay. Um, you know, going back to this idea that we try and make everything very practice focused. Part of that too is, you know, yes, we get people to incorporate what they're reading and, and the new ideas they're coming across, but we try and do it in a relevant format. So I know in the subject that Megan and I teach together, strategic learning and workplaces, we get people to put together a presentation of their ideas, you know, a presentation of their learning strategy. Um, you know, in other subjects you might do, if, if you're doing the master's, you do a research practice a subject and in that one you would write a research proposal in that sort of format. Um, so I guess they're research based in the sense of, yeah, we really want you to incorporate what you're learning, but we try as hard as possible to make them really relevant and authentic to you know, what's actually happening out there in, out there in the wild. Amazing. Thank you, Amanda. And our final question of the evening, I'm going to throw this to the panel and you can all share your responses, but for teachers who undertake this course, how does the course contribute to the NISA highly accomplished and or lead teacher programs in contributing to professional development hours? I'm probably not as qualified to answer this as you might think, but I think, I don't know if Ben, you have some thoughts on those sort of things. I do know we've had people do it and then have applied to use the time. So it's not an automatic thing, um, but I believe, yes, you can incorporate it um, into your professional development hours and apply through NESA to have it recognised. Fantastic. Does anybody else in the panel want to share any thoughts or insights, sir? Uh, sorry, I'll just jump in. I'd, I'd probably just echo that, Amanda. I, I, I didn't, um, but just uh, with a, a vague understanding of the processes, I think it is a uh, worthwhile discussion to have with um, with whoever heads that up within your within your school or directly with with Nessa. And I'm sure that there's um, there's some some positives to be had there. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Ben. And we've got one more question that's just come through. One of our audience members has asked, what is the weekly time commitment for a full-time working professional in hours? Now, my understanding is about 15 to 20 hours each week. What was the panel's thoughts on this? Uh, Megan here. I would say that, yes, it, it is that is an estimated one, but I will say that there are definitely times when it'll uh, be either more or less. So it's really how you manage your time and what you focus on. A lot of the time, the way the subjects are designed is that they're designed to scaffold to help you do your assessments. And, and that's one of the advantages of it is that if you actually work through it and give you know a set amount of time to it, then you will be able to do it. And, and as somebody who worked full time or who works full time and worked full time, um, while teaching the masters as well as doing it, uh, it was really possible. It just meant that I had to manage my time. And, you know, I had to have some very open discussions with my wife about what that looked like at home uh, in advance. And so, you know, I set up clear times and blocked things out, but uh, that's because I'm a little bit of a time management obsessive. So, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, we definitely suggest to people like 15, 20 is the guide. I think, you know, some people have good weeks, bad weeks. We, we know that happens. Sometimes people would send me an email and apologise. They haven't caught up. It's like, that's fine. You, you do you. We're here if you need us kind of thing. Um, but I think that the advice we usually give people is little and often is a good mantra. But I think it's a really good point Megan makes about the how the assessments work because we've tried where possible to have activities that you can get feedback on that, are actually part of preparing for the assessment. And so you don't have to do as much double work. It's not like doing all the online activities plus the assessment. We've tried to integrate them where it's relevant to do so to kind of minimize the load, but still um, do learning. So we use a lot of assessment as learning as a tool as well. 
Wonderful. Thank you so much. We now have to bring our webinar for this evening to a close. Firstly, I would love to thank our panel of wonderful academics for being here with us tonight and for sharing all of your highly engaging insights into the program. For our audience, if you have any further questions, you're most welcome to contact your student enrollment advisor. You can reach us through the details shared on the screen or you can simply click the link that we have shared in the chat box to schedule a 15 minute call at a time that suits you. Thank you again to our academic team for taking the time to sit down with interested learners and we hope you'll all be taking the next steps to lodge an application to upskill with UTS online. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Thanks all. Bye. Thank you. Bye.